So Carol, who has been working with me in the office for the last year and a half, says you always gotta watch out when he comes back from vacation. Because he comes back fired up and ready to go, and he is. So we're gonna take a look today at the beginning of a lesson, and we're gonna move into a series over the next seven, eight weeks that I'm gonna share with you, the book that we're gonna be using. And it's an opportunity to move forward. And I'm gonna say this before I get started, I say it many, I've said it many other times. I only can teach from my own experience. I only can teach for what works for me. And I've spent my entire life looking for truth. No matter what the religion was, no matter what race it was, no matter what country it came from, it didn't matter to me. What I wanted was truth. That was the driving force of my whole life. And there is a saying where Jesus says in the New Testament, he says, look, there is a time for you to put baby food aside. And there's a time for you to start eating the meat of adults. And what he was symbolizing there was your spiritual journey can stay whatever it is if you want it. But if you want to move to something bigger, you've got to open up your consciousness. You've got to open up your mind. You've got to begin to look for things that will take you to the next step. And that has been my journey for 30, 40 years. And one of the things is we're, as we're in week 13 now of kind of reshaping the spiritual center. It looks and feels different than it did 13 weeks ago. And we're going to continue to do that because here's one of the things that I want to talk about just briefly today. There are two kinds of people who attend a spiritual center or a church. There are those who are spectators. They want to be entertained. They want to hear a great talk. They want to hear lots of music. And they want to leave with the report card and say, well, the minister did well today. Or he didn't do so well. That's a spectator. That is not what we're moving to here. We're moving to doers. We're moving to those who come to grow, who want to change their lives, who want to change the world, be the light to the world. And the only way we can do that, and you've heard me say this, I'll say it again and again, probably a thousand times. We know from science and from quantum physics that the universe is growing 12% a year. If you and I are not growing 12% a year, spiritually and otherwise, we are falling behind. That's why there's a sense of urgency in me. Because 12% is a big growth, is it not? But when you start to understand compounding, 12 on top of 12, on top of 12, on top of 12, four or five years from now, you stand back and those who are not making those moves are falling way behind. We're not gonna let that happen. I can't let it happen for me because it's what drives me and it's what excites me about the poss possibility of the future. At all levels, I'm excited about what's happened with, with the world. I'm, I'm excited about kids that are coming in today. They're coming in at such a higher consciousness than you and I came in. And we're seeing the world now globally. It's connected by internet, no matter where you are. You know, 40% of the world does not have cell phones. That will change within the next year because cell phones are now going to use satellites. No, no longer will need towers. We will see the whole world, 8.3 billion people connected for the first time in the history. So, so many things are happening at this time. We want to make sure that we're on the edge of that in our spiritual life and our spiritual growth. One of the things that attracted me to unity and why I was willing to spend three years of my life to go to Unity Ministerial School was late in Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity, said this, I reserve the right to change my mind based on new revelations. That spoke to my heart. That spoke to my soul because I had seen so many religions, movements, spiritual movements, where the founders really got this divine ideas and then after they were gone, then you had all the humans come in and put CEOs in place and CFOs and, you know, hierarchies and make it into a business. And they lost the cutting edge of technology. 
They lost the cutting edge of technology applied to spirituality because they kept running the same thing that the founders had said. And it, what happens when you do that is it turns into dogma and creeds and practices. And you miss the essence of the spirit, the power of the spirit. And so that was one of the things that drove me. And one of the things about Charles that I think we all need to re recognize is he wrote 100 years ago, plus 120 he began. So he wrote at the highest level that he knew. But what I loved about Charles is he was willing to look all over the world. He looked at what was happening in yoga. He looked at what the Bhagavad Gita was doing. He looked at what the Tao Te Ching was doing, just like we have here over the last couple of years. And this is the next step that I've taken. So I, I share with you some of my frustrations also when I went to ministerial school. Because this story of the ascension of the master teacher no one could tell me what it meant and how does it apply to you and me. Because the way I approach the Master Teacher Jesus or Buddha or Krishna or the Tao Te Ching is that it's a, a lesson for you and I. It's an example. I believe those avatars were way showers. They were not exceptions, they were examples. And when I kept asking it, for three years, I asked every one of my instructors I had, well, tell me about this story and tell me how it applies to my life and how can I make it work? I want to do that. I want to ascend. And I got hubba da hubba da hubba da hubba. <laughs> you ever hear that when you ask spiritual questions that nobody knows what you're ta they're talking about and they give you some religious answer? It's like, no, that didn't work. And so I kept asking this question over and over again, and no one could tell me what was that example and how do I accomplish it. I was very frustrated with that. And this is what he said, the master teacher said, I'm leaving to go back to the Father, and I'm preparing a place for you, Dan. And where I am, you will be also. Well, those the answer to this, you've probably heard it too, I got it. Well, that happens after you die. No, no. That's not what he taught. He taught whatever I'm doing in this present moment, you can do and I can do. And so this was driving me to try to find answers, and I was not getting answers in that structure. Not surprising. So I went to Charles Fillmore's book where he defines all these words. And he says this, ascending process, progress, occurs in three stages, going from animal consciousness, mental consciousness, spiritual consciousness. And my answer to that was that worked 120 years ago. That didn't answer my question. I get that we progress, right? We've seen that in ourselves. We learn how to do affirmations, denials, and we move up into the mental consciousness. But that didn't tell me how to ascend. It appeased maybe a lot of people, but it didn't me. Because I'm, I'm the how-to guy. Tell me how to do this. And no one could answer how to do it. So that kept my whole search going and going. And looking for a way that you know, because I read somewhere at one time early in my search was the reason our soul comes here is so that we can ascend back to the Godhead, back to the essence, back to perfection. I want that. I want it, and I want it to know how now. This comes from, I don't know how many of you have seen Rorick's work. Uh, Nicholas Rorick was a Russian anthropologist who went to the Himalayas, went to Tibet, went to China, went to India in the 1920s. If you Google his artwork, it is some of the most spiritual, divine, the light just flows out of his work. But what he did was he went to the caves, he went to the monasteries, and 
in that period of 18 years where Jesus disappeared in the Bible from age 12 to 30, he was in Tibet. He was in the Himalayas. He was in China. He was in India. There are carvings on the caves. There are manuscripts in the uh, monasteries. And one of these came from, well, he wrote the book called Himalaya. If you, if you really want to get into it, it's an amazing book. And I got to tell you, I rocked their world out there at the ministerial school because I had did one of my major papers on where Jesus disappeared for 18 years. This is documented. It's you, the artwork's there, the manuscripts are there, but it's been one of those covers up that nobody, no religious people want you to know. And here's one of the reasons. This was in one of the manuscripts in a monastery where he lived for a couple of years. And he took it out to quote. And Jesus said to them, he was talking to those in the monastery, I came to show human possibilities. What has been created by me, all men and women can create. All that which I am, they can be too. Well, as I picked that up, it made me even more determined that I was going to find out the how-to to do everything. Because that's what he was showing us, right? He was showing the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension. Well, Christianity in the West has done a really good job with crucifixion. I mean, right? They put him on the cross and left him there. They got pictures of that and symbols of that. And I mean, you want to scare the bejesus out of a young kid, well, have him sitting in a room and look up at something hanging off a cross. I mean, come on. That's called brainwash. But it stops there. It stops with the crucifixion and a little bit about the resurrection. But somehow we missed the ascension piece, which was the most important thing I believe that he was teaching. Absolutely no different than what Buddha taught. He ascended. And you go into the Old Testament, Enoch did, Prophet Enoch did, and so did Moses, and so did Elijah. I mean, it's over and over and over again. I'm like, well, how can you not teach the most important thing for us to learn? And then Jesus said this. I'll tell you the truth. Now, for the greatest teacher, master teacher, to say that, I would think, y'all, we want to pay attention, don't you? When he says, I'm going to tell you the truth. Anything that I did, you can do and more. Well, this, this little verse gets hidden away, too, with the ascension piece. But what he was teaching was, again, I'm teaching human possibilities, as he said in the Himalayas, and I, anything that I show you, you can do, you can do, if you begin to ask how and why and move forward with that process. So we come to a concept that I ran up about 20 years ago, and I did, never had heard it in my whole life, and this is a term, ascended masters. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, ascension, ascended, that's how you become an ascended master. You need to ascend, just like Buddha taught, just like Jesus taught. Ascended masters are divine beings who have merged their higher self and no longer have a physical body and no longer have to come back to this school of lessons. When I heard about this, I said, now that's what I want. I don't care how many lifetimes, I don't care how many years, that's what I want. Well, when you start to look at it from that perspective and you begin to see what Buddha taught and what Jesus taught, they said it's available for all of us. It's not a, they were no special exceptions. That's what they taught. It's not what people have been taught. And there's a reason for that is because once you get this, you don't need priests and you don't need rabbis and you don't need preachers. Right? It's within you and within me to be able to become ascended and get to the place where we don't come back again. So starting next Sunday and next Tuesday, we're going to start Tuesday night classes again. This is the book we're going to study. It's called The Spiritual Quest. It's by the prophets. And it's the teachings of the ascended masters. As I said, I began to study this 20-some years ago. And I keep coming back to it because it's the only place I was finding answers for these questions that I keep 
that I presented here today. And we're going to touch on a little bit of this, where it came from, and just the beginning of the understanding of it. And if you're going to now begin to understand what we started to do 13 weeks ago and the changing of this spiritual center into a place of doers and participation versus being entertained and sitting back disconnected from what's happening. Even the five minutes you just did, you're participating, right? In the decrees, you're participating. We've done energy work in the chakras. You're going to see why that's important because as we learn to move energy through our bodies and our minds and our emotions and our memory bodies, our unconscious and subconscious, that's part of the process of going to the next step. So starting next Sunday, you'll see more about it. Um, you can participate on Sundays and Tuesdays without buying the book. Because as you know, I do an overview on Sunday and then Tuesday we go deep, deeper. But I'm excited about this. It's a wonderful book. It's very easy to read. A lot of white space and a lot of pictures. But it's really, really the next level of teaching that I know. So where did all this start in the U.S.? Around 1875, Helena Blotsky began to write in New York City and began a Theosophical Society. I don't know if you can read what it says around their emblem, but it says there is no religion greater than truth. Well, when I connected with that, I felt something inside of me. It was like, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. And as I began to do some studies of that, this was the beginning for me to begin to open my mind up to something other than what was taught in the Western world around Orthodox Christianity. And she said this in one of her books. When there were no churches and no creeds and no sects, no dogma, no exercises, but when every man and woman was a priest or priestess for themselves. This is 100% in alignment with what Jesus taught. It's 100% in alignment with Buddha taught. And as we begin to look at how do we become that more for ourselves, to me that's the next level of the journey, of the spiritual journey. This may be too small to read, but what Gandhi said is this, when I read her works, it allowed me the opportunity to begin to study Hinduism and find out for myself that what the missionaries were teaching me, that Hinduism was nothing but a bunch of non-truth, is basically what they taught. So who were the missionaries? The missionaries were the Christians who came from England to control India. And if Gandhi hadn't read the book and understood that he could study Hinduism and learn the truth that's in there, we probably would not have the nonviolent freedom that happened in India. So you can see the effects of some of this teaching has had on major, major movements within the world in the last hundred some years. But this was another thing that struck me in this teaching. If there is no me, there is love. If there is no me, there is love. Very short little saying. It was credited to Krishnamurti, I think about 20, 30, 40 years ago. If there is no Dan, if there is no Dan ego, if there is no human here, what's left is pure love. Well, that takes us back to what we are inside. It takes us back to that divinity within us. And it is completely, again, in the alignment that Jesus and Buddha taught. If we learn to not be me in the human sense and allow myself to get connected with the divine within me, there's nothing there but love. You know, I share some of these in, in the context of 2021 and in what's going on in this country and the wars between religions and between races and between political parties and between everything. We have not many examples of love. 
It's because everyone's so addicted to the me. I, me, and mine. And the love can't come through. They cannot coexist. You cannot be half pregnant with it. It's either love or it's me. And as we begin to let go of me, the love comes out. And to me, that's what this next whole journey is through October and November with this process. What happened next was an ascended master called Saint Germain. I'd never heard of him, but when I found his books 20 some years ago, it was called the I Am Discourses. Well, I was already attracted to I Am because it's a name that God said is his. And when I saw the I Am Discourses, I began to read. Now there are volumes one to 33. Um, there are three or 400 pages. There are very, very thick, deep books. And I am very proud to have one of the only libraries in this country that has all 33 original volumes. And I've read every one of them, some of them more than once, three or four times. But what happened is what I love about Guy Ballard is he was a gold mining engineer in California in the gold rush, which is so interesting how that correlates because Charles Fillmore was in the gold rush in Southern California and Colorado in the real estate end of it, all happening about the same time. And he went on to Kansas City and Guy and Edna ended up in Mount Shasta, which is in the northern part of California. While he was there, he began to get these downloads at night. He'd, beget, he'd get awakened in the middle of the night and it was like, get your pen. And he started writing. He didn't have a computer then, he didn't have word processor, he did it all by hand. He did 33 volumes that were downloaded through him. And in there was Saint Germain introduced for the very first time that I know of, is this whole concept of the violet fire. He talks about how the violet fire was what was taught in all of the wisdom schools back through Egypt and Greece and Rome and through all time, but it was only taught to very few people because it's so powerful that they didn't want it in the hands of people who would misuse it. In this process of the 33 volumes was brought this whole idea that it needs to be brought to the public because of what was happening in the world. Remember 1930s, what was going on then? We were in a world war. And the idea was if we could bring this spiritual force the most powerful spiritual force to the use of people like you and I, that we could begin to balance the negativity that was going on. This all started before the bombs were dropped, which I think also set up an incredible amount of karma. So that was the introduction. There was a gentleman then in Washington, D.C. in the late 50s, his name was Mark Prophet, who began to get the same downloads after Guy was no longer around. And you can see a picture of Mark and his wife Elizabeth when the, they were with Mother Teresa over in India. And they began to bring together Eastern and Western ideas through a place called Summit Lighthouse. Now, if you Google Summit Lighthouse and if you Google Mark and Elizabeth Prophet, you're going to get the same kind of stuff that you're going to get around unity. It's a cult. That's the typical Orthodox Christian approach that anything that challenges what they teach they're going to call it a cult. So you can Google it, you'll find it there. The way I approach things like that is I begin to read them. And I take it inside and I say, does it feel like truth to me? Is there things here that will help me get better at what I do? And when the answer is yes, and you're going to see this whole teaching in the next seven weeks is about you doing the work. It's not about listening to me. Listening to me is, I mean, you've got better things to do. Barry, we could be on the golf course today, right? Nice day, It'll be a great day. So you've got better things to do, you've got to do the work though. And if you're willing to take your blinders off here, you're willing to move your envelopes, you're gonna have the most incredible next seven or eight weeks as we dive into this very deeply. It's the only thing that has begun to give me answers for what I've been looking for for all these years. So Jesus said this in Luke, the kingdom of God cannot be seen. It's not observable. Well, let me back up. What's the kingdom of God? Because he used two words here. He said kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. 
and he used them both inter intermittently. So what is that? See, we use these words, we hear these words, and we don't say, well, what is it? How does it apply? Here's my answer for kingdom of God. It's the consciousness of the divine. It's the mind and the emotions and the beliefs, the consciousness. That consciousness cannot be seen with physical eyes. We can say low here and low there, and it cannot be found anywhere in the physical. Why? Because this con kingdom of God, this consciousness lies within you and me. He said that. Now, they don't preach that. They forgot this verse, too. Right? The power's in you. The power's in me. Not in a preacher. Not in a priest. Not in a rabbi. Within us. And if we get that it's within us, and then we learn how to connect with it, then it's possible to do what I've been asking is how do we become ascended? How do we ascend at the end of this lifetime instead of continuing to go on through and come back. I don't want to come back. I made that very clear to the universe, to God. That is not my plan. My plan is not to come back. I want to be one of those. And I think you have to get to a place where you make that decision. Are you, is that important to you in this lifetime or not? And if it is, then we begin to look for ways to do this. So this comes out. It started with Guy in the 1930s and then got um, further evolved into this. This is a chart of you and me. They call it the chart of your divine self. And those three figures that you see there are all in you. They're not outside of you, the way we've been taught. They're inside of us, just like Jesus taught. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it down into the segments because as we start this journey, we're gonna use this chart a lot because it begins to change completely how you approach what you do during the day. It will completely change the way you believe what happens to you after you leave here. You know, the number one fear for most human beings is what? Dying. By the time we're done in seven weeks, you'll have absolutely no fear of death. If you, if it connects with you and it's something that you, for me, I have zero, zero concern about the moment that I leave this planet. My concern is I wanna, I want to ascend at the end of it. So let's look at that. The top of this is called the I am presence, or the God. I am, I am means the God within you. And so that top of the chart, as you see that brilliant white in the middle, is the piece of God that is individualized within you and me. I hear so many people still here at Unity Harrisburg or in Unity speak as though God is outside of them. Is it's like me and God. That's not what he said. He said it's within you. And this chart begins to get the understanding that when you talk about God, you're talking about something that's within you. When you pray, you pray to something within you, not outside of you. And as we begin to make that shift, we begin to understand that the power that lies within us and that God presence, which is the only best way I know to describe it is a chunk of God is put inside of you and I when we get born. And we'll talk more about that as we go. How does that happen? And what does it look like? But I think this is paramount in our understanding to go to the next step. That that power, that wisdom, that love, that joy, that happiness, that balance is inside. It's not outside. So as we begin to understand that piece, that's the I am presence of the God within the next figure coming down is your Christ self, or higher self, some people use. This is your mediator for you and I, because you cannot take perfection and not perfection, which is what I am, and those two cannot mix without a mediator in spirit, in energy. And it's in this process, as we begin to take on our higher self, our true self, our Christ self, and you're gonna see an, one that's in the East, they put Buddha here, Buddha nature. It's that essence of perfection that a human being became 
and then was able to ascend. And that lies between perfection and who we are in the moment and guides us and teaches us and in many cases is our guide, guiding angel. Many times when people will say, well, I looked up and I saw this incredible thing of light, you, they're seeing up and down this. Now, one of the things I want you to see on this chart, which is very, it's hard to see, but from the very top of the God presence running down to the human being in the bottom is a silver cord. The silver cord is talked of many times, especially in the Old Testament, a few times in the New Testament. And it's that connection that we have with God. I don't know how many of you have had the incredible honor to be with someone when they transition. But the essence that I get when I'm, when I'm with someone is that goes back up the cord and the cord disappears out of the body. And when you're there, the body just absolutely collapses as soon as the life force is gone. Well, that's how it works is it, it leaves that physical body and goes back up through to the I am presence and that is how our soul and our memory bodies leave the body behind. And it, it just literally, within minutes, you can see it just. So we know we have this life force. You know, the East calls it chi, reiki. The Japanese call it ki, ki. India calls it piranha. In the West, I guess the best word would be for life force. And it's where, how the life force runs. It runs down that crystal or silver cord into our physical body. And we'll talk more about this and how we interact with that. The last figure on there is you and I, our soul and our bodies in the physical. And as you can see, it's surrounded by the violet fire in this tube of light. And I'm showing this today because we're gonna build upon this the next couple of weeks. How do we invoke the violet fire? Why do we invoke the violet fire? And what does it do for us? And I want you to see in that figure is right here is where the heart is. You're going to see three flumes and a fire. And we're going to talk more about that as we go on. But as I said, this was the only people and their teaching was able to match what Jesus and Buddha taught and began to make sense for me. Here's a picture I showed. Of, here's the Buddha nature in the middle instead of the Christ. This is more of an Eastern picture versus a West. Either one, you can take on the Buddha nature and you can take on the Christ consciousness. What Jesus said to us, put on the mind that was in the Christ, right? Buddha taught, put on the heart and the wisdom that was in the Buddha. Same kind of teaching, same kind of idea that as mortal human beings, we need to have this spiritual essence begin to happen within us that allows us to change how we live our lives. This is another one of those verses that gets lost. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. They forget the fire piece most of the time because they go to Luke where it doesn't use fire. But there was a teaching there where this was John the Baptist said when this master teacher comes, he's gonna teach you how to be baptized in Holy Spirit. And I've said over and over again, I believe if Jesus was teaching today, it would be holy energy. Back then it was the best that they knew to explain what was going on with this unseeable power that flows through us. And fire. Well, let's look at baptize, what's that mean? It's the Greek word baptizio, and it means to be immersed. So what he's saying here is this teacher that's coming will teach you how to be completely immersed in the holy energy and this fire. Well, the definition of the fire that you and I have talked about and we began to implement here is this whole notion of the violet fire, is part of this immersion into holy energy. Again, it has to happen within us, right? And if it happens within us, then it can begin to happen and manifest externally. As in the physical body, in the physical light, the spiritual light is also has seven rays, just like when you go through the prism. And the violet is the highest and most powerful of the vibrations. And that's why I believe that that is the fire that we evoke. That's the fire we use in the decrees that come down and begin to transmute the things in us that are not in the perfection that we are moving towards. And we'll get into this in more detail. But I want to give you some things that St. Germain says in both of these teachings that I pulled out. 
When you invoke the violet fire in the name of God, it descends as a beam of spiritual energy, and it bursts into spiritual flame in your heart as the qualities of mercy, forgiveness, justice, freedom, and transmutation. Who does not want that within them? And that's what connected me with this teaching. Is like, I want that. I want to feel mercy when I don't feel mercy. That's the human heart of me. But there's a divine heart of me that begins to take over. And I believe this teaching is the only way from a ground roots level up that we're going to save this planet. Because what's being done religious-wise, what's being done politically, is not working. Flat ain't working. And as more and more people begin to become the light of the world and become this light that begins to connect with the people around them and make the change from this incredible place of power of divine love, there is no place for hate. There is no place for racism or bigotry. There no, there's no place for my religion is better than your religion. I'm better than you are. It cannot exist in this divine love. It will eat it up in the fire. He went on to say this, this violet fire is something of a transcendent nature takes place. And I'm sure, now this was written in 1930s, I'm sure that eventually science will discover what it is that happens when we invoke the violet thing. We have not done that yet. Quantum physics is getting close. Some of the things that we're seeing, how we can transmute atoms and electrons and what's going on in this space within there and that's where this plays, it's pretty amazing. So he says, we have four lower bodies. We have a physical body, a mental body, an emotional body, and this is the body most of, most of us don't know about. It's our etheric body or our memory body. It's the body that holds our subconscious mind. It's our body that holds those beliefs that we have learned through domestication from the time we were seven. And you're like, well, why am I reacting to that person? Why am I being triggered? It isn't happening up here consciously, it's happening out of the memory body. It's the unconscious, the subconscious things that are held in that memory body. And that's also where we hold our beliefs and where we hold our karmic debt. What is karmic debt? Karmic debt is when, uh, whenever we misuse the energy of God in a way that is impossible. And I don't know about you, but I've done a lot of it. And I think I've done a lot of it in other lifetimes. Like I said, I have big lessons. Well, you get big lessons when you got big karma, right? But the, we hold those, they go with us. And this is a way that we can begin to transmute those. And when we release them into the light, we now no longer have to come from those things that are held in the unconscious. The violet flame works on all four of these lower bodies by changing the rate of their vibration. We just came through Abraham. And we know what happens with your vibration, right? Your vibration is what attracts law of attraction to your vibration. As you begin to clean out all of this unconscious stuff and all these beliefs, what are you going to attract? You're going to begin to attract at a higher level. And you're going to see it manifest in your life. I got examples of this in the last 13 weeks of some folks who have been practicing and what's happened in their lives. Because I, be, I kind of snuck some of this in on Tuesday night. And we began to do it. And when you begin to do it more consciously, you see absolute miracles begin to happen because we're now vibrating at a much higher level. The violet flame permeates every cell and atom of your body. Again, this is St. Germain, 1930s. Into your mind, your emotions, your subconscious, and all your memories. That's karmic debt. And this is where it begins to permeate inside of every cell, every atom. The violet flame forgives as it frees. It consumes as it transmutes. It clears the records of past karma, thus balancing our debt to life. And it equalizes the flow of energy between yourself and others, other life streams. I like how he uses the word life stream. That's you and me. We're life streams. And propels you into the arms of the living God. I don't know about you, but it doesn't get any more spiritual than that. And it was written in 1930s, and it was poo-pooed as cult. 
That's, to me, when I read this, I felt it in my soul. And that's what I would invite you to do. Throw off the blinders and just feel it. And does it feel like truth to you? And if it does, then take it another step. If it doesn't, let it be. I say this about everything that I teach. But if it feels like truth to you, because the only place you know truth is inside you. Just because it's my truth doesn't mean it's yours. And you've got to feel it. You've got to experience it for yourself so that it becomes the power that it can within you. The use of the violet fire consuming flame is more valuable, valuable to you and to all of mankind than all the wealth, all the gold, and all the jewels of this planet. He's talking about external things don't matter anymore because this puts you on a path to answer the question I started with. How do you ascend? How do you become an ascended master? There is a pattern. There is a path. There is a way to get there, and there are tools. And what I love about St. Germain's work and all of the work I've been talking about, it's always answers how. They never dodge. They never run. They say, do this and see how it feels. Well, to me, that's, that's the kind of answers I'm looking for. So finally, St. Germain said this. Try it for yourself. What do you have to lose? And his suggestion is you do this, which we now do on Sundays. I am a being of the violet fire. I am the purity God desires. Remember what I am is. I am is the God within me. So what I'm saying when I declare this is the God within me is a being of the violet fire. The God within me is the purity that God desires. Repeated nine times, he said, do this once a day for 30 days and see what happens in 30 days in your life. I don't know how many people, spiritual teachers, are willing to put out that kind of challenge, which is basically what it is. And when I saw that, I was like, well, you're on. Anybody wants to challenge me with that for 30 days, I can do that nine times. And I've learned how to do it. I use this now all day long. Anytime I feel my gut get tied up, I'm right back to do nine of these. And I, it just dissipates. And it, it is, I can tell story upon story and other people's stories, but it doesn't matter. What matters is for you. So what I welcome you to do is take the challenge that St. Germain gave. Nine times, once a day, anybody has time to do it, it takes about nine seconds, 10 seconds. For 30 days, commit yourself for 30 days and look back, keep a, keep a journal. Look back and say, here's where I was. Let me show you what happened in 30 days. That's how you move to know me. That's how you move to faith. That's how you move to trust at a whole nother level. So that, that's my invitation there to try it out, see what it is, and as we'll start next week, we'll start on chapter one of the spiritual quest. All right, so.